And so I bought these nice towels. They were nice. They were comfortable. They were soft. And we stayed in this apartment, and um, we were on the bottom floor. And if anybody lives on the bottom floor, sometimes you pay, pay for the transgressions of those above us. So some wonderful person decided to flood the toilet intentionally to get back at their roommates. And our apartment was flooded with that stinky sewage. My husband in Mercy Road just went and started grabbing a towel, and he grabbed my pretty, <laughs> soft, comfortable, fuzzy towel, <laughs> and threw it on that stinky, polluted water so that he may get it up. I want to let you know, brothers and sisters, that towel has never been the same. <laughs> no matter how many times we washed it, it has not returned to a soft, comfortable, fuzzy, enticing self. In fact, even after you just just do bathe and you and you dry yourself off one time, it goes. You have to wash it again. It does not hold the same quality and value after it encountered this polluted situation. So, for me, Sister Mia, I just want to throw away the towel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to put up with this towel. Come on, Mia. This towel not performing in the way it's supposed to perform. This towel is not giving me pleasure right. the way I need it to give me pleasure. Right. This towel is now disgusting and right. irreprehensible right. to me. Right. I want to get rid of the towel. Yeah. So, the thing is, these may have come into your life that have polluted you a little bit, yeah. Yeah. dirtied you up. Change your mindset. Made you look lower than what you used to be. You are not the same after these encounters. But God is not like Sister Mia. Hallelujah. He does not say, come on, goodbye to that time. To you. In fact, he suffers long with you. Um, on this morning, we're going to um, have two verses um, that we will come from. The first will be James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. And when you have it or when you can read it on the screen, say amen. <laughs> My brethren, count it all joy, all joy, when you fall into various um, um, trials. We don't mind standing, please. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work. That you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 4 says, Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. Amen. On this morning, our title of our uh, message will be The Prize of Patience. Amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. You know, I never, ever, 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 ever wanted to teach middle school. I never wanted to teach junior high. In fact, when I first started off my career in teaching, I said to many people that I did not want to teach first grade, and I never wanted to teach junior high. Then God blessed us to um, have our first daughter. And while I was pregnant on maternity leave, we had new administrators who did not know me. We had a new change, new climate change. And all my requests for the upcoming year about me put being put and staying in the second grade and third grade was null and void. Because they did not know me and they did not know where to put me. Guess where they put me? First grade. First grade. And then when I got ready to move into Waller, the Holy Spirit, gave me instructions about taking my certification to be a junior high school teacher. So I took the test, God bless me to pass the test, and then on top of the test, I applied to almost every single school in Waller ISD. Because I'm certified to teach from the little bitties all the way to the biggins in high school. I applied at the elementaries, the junior highs, and the uh, high school, because there's yeah, still only one right now, praise the Lord. But only one um, school called me back. In fact, I mixed her call, they called me back again. And it was Waller Junior High. I would argue that 90% of my job is not teaching. Now, yes, I'm supposed to teach the students about emphasis and context clues. 
Yes, I'm supposed to teach them about how to analyze the plot within a story. I'm supposed to help them identify the main idea and even how to create a perfect response. But I would argue that 90% of my job is not teaching them. 90% of my job as a teacher and even as a mother is repetition. Repeating myself over and over and over again. On the Praise the Lord. <laughs> the last time God blessed me to speak, we talked about the prize of patience. While we in English may have, uh, we may define patience as simply putting up with things, putting up with stuff, putting up with people. Biblically, patience is broken down into two concepts. The first concept is endurance, and the second concept is long suffering. While these two words may seem like they mean the same thing. They have the same definition. There is an illustration to help us distinguish what is the difference between long suffering and endurance. The Bible teaches us in Hebrews 12 and 2, you look at Jesus, the author, the perfecter of my faith, right. who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Right. Jesus endured the cross. Right. He endured the weeping, whipping, the beating, the spitting, the booing, the crown of thorns, Jesus endured the cross yes, and the path to the cross. Yes, Jesus endured it all, but he suffered long with those who betrayed him. Yes, he suffered long with those who were crucifying him. He suffered long with those who nailed him to the cross, who lied on him and who mocked them, which lets me know that typically long suffering has to deal with being patient in difficult situations that involves people. Mm -hmm. While endurance normally applies to being patient in our difficult circumstances. Right. And a key verse today, James instructs us to count it all joy Amen. when you encounter trials. When a trial comes in, knocks at your door. Right. They didn't call you ahead of time. Oh, man. They didn't ask for permission, could they come by? Right. They saw you were home and said, oh good, you're home. <laughs> Let me in. Right. Because when our faith is tested, patience, patience, endurance is produced in our lives. Right. And when we allow endurance to work in our lives, we become perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Right. James is encouraging the saints to not back out of trials that you come across. When that trial come and knock at your door, don't shut the door in their face and tap out. On, James is encouraging the saints to not let go of the trials and not say, I'm not going to deal with you today. On, don't turn off your endurance. Yes, and Jesus actually already told us this. He said that in this world, there will be many tribulations. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. He said that you ain't come across a whole bunch of stuff. Right. But be of good cheer. Because I have already overcome the world. What a difference it will make in our lives, in a child of God's life. What a difference it will make in a children of God's life. When we keep in mind that when we come into these environments that we call toxic. When we step into these situations that are thorns in our flesh. When we come across dark times. When we remember that God, Jesus, has already overcome. What a difference. It will make it even in our mindset and our outcome. Yes, we may struggle and yes, we may fight, but we remember that Jesus, you've already overcome this. Yeah. Great is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So therefore, I will rejoice in the God of my creation. What a difference it will make. Not only in my life, but in the world around me, when I remember that Jesus already got this. So my stress is in vain. My anxiety is for nothing. What keeps me up at night should be putting me to sleep. Because Jesus has already overcome it. God already has the victory, which gives credence to Hebrews 10, 35 through 36. The author says, therefore, don't throw away your confidence. This confidence has a great reward. For you are in need of endurance. You need endurance. You need endurance. So that after you have done the will of God, you will receive what was promised. 
My endurance in a situation when trials come is necessary for me. Say that again. My endurance in the middle of these trials is necessary for me. Because God said, I'm making you perfect. I'm completing you. You don't realize it, but you were lacking before this trial came into your life. You don't realize it, but you have some issues that need to be straightened out. You have some wrinkles that need to be ironed out before this trial knocked at your door. But so often, we throw away our confidence. We throw away our faith. The moment the battle gets to, we may start off thinking we're going to do this, but then we throw away our faith. Notice that James does not teach us that trials produce faith. Trials do not produce me believing in God. They test my faith. They test my faith and they produce enduring patience so if trial does not create my faith what creates my faith that's a good question class i'm so grateful yes y'all asked me that in romans 10 and 17 the word said that faith comes by hearing, hearing and hearing by the word of, word of god oh praise the lord people listen to sunday school amen <laughs> But this correlates to what Jesus said in Luke 8 when he teaches the parable of the seed. The seed represents the word of God. The word of God will go forth. The word of God will go forth. And that seed is going to fall to different kinds of grounds. There are some wayside, some roads that's been building up so that, ro- that, that, that dirt is hardened. There are some rocky grounds to where the, the roots can't establish themselves. There are some weedy um, grounds to where that seed is able to enter the ground, but then it gets choked out. By the cares of life. But then there's some good ground. Yes, and the Bible says that when the word of God goes forth and it falls onto good ground, that that good ground is able to produce fruit Hallelujah. with Amen. endurance. Yeah. Because it's not just the word of God falling into my lap. I have to take out the weeds that want to pop up and choke out that word. Amen. I have to remove rocks and pebbles that may come around. You know, I really don't know how the rocks and pebbles get there, but as I'm gardening, every time I'm tilling my soil, I'm like, how did this rock get here? I thought I already took out everything. But yet I find something else that needs to be removed out of my garden so that what I want to grow, that what's going to benefit me and benefit my environment in order for it to flourish, I have to take it out. Regardless of how it got there, I need to take it out. So the word of God goes forth and it's our job to take care of that seed. Amen. 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 Furthermore, Paul helps us to understand the mind of spiritual warfare in Ephesians 6. He tells us to pull on the full armor of God. Okay. He t- breaks down a different piece of armor, but I'm going to focus on one that's important for this lesson. Part of the armor that Paul tells us to put on is the shield of faith. Mm-hmm. Believing in God's word is our defense. Amen. Believing in God's word is your defense against Satan. That's good. Good. You know they have that saying that God said it, I believe it, yeah. Yeah. that settles it. Yeah. It's not settled with us. Right. Huh. Right. It's not settled. I'm sorry. Sometimes, but as we mature in God, we start adopting that mindset. God said that he is a reward of those who diligently yes, seek him. Right. So I don't see the evidence in my prayer, but you sent me a word that you are a reward of those who diligently right. seek. Right. And in your word, you also that said that you are not a man that you should lie. Right. Nor are you the son of man that you should change your mind. Right. So Lord, you told me, you gave me your word. Right. Right. Lord, you said if I lift you up, you'll draw me in right. unto you. That's your word. So when God says it, I believe it. And Satan, as he attacks me with his fiery darts in Ephesians 6 and 16, the more he attacks me, the more I raise up my shield of faith, the more I'm able to quench out his attacks. So Satan is able to attack us time after time after time after time. And he's able to win because we lower our faith in God. Come on, yeah. 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 Satan has victory in our lives simply by spreading doubt. Yeah. Wow. wow. Simply by whispering to your ear that this is not going to work out. Right. 
Go ahead and tap out. Go ahead and quit that job. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead and leave your marriage. It's okay. Right. Go ahead and give up on your children. It's okay. Go ahead and just smoke. It's okay. Yeah. When we give in to what the enemy says, we are lowering our share of faith. And Satan is able to say, God. Yeah, yeah. And that fiery dart that he sent not only pierces us, but it starts to burn us up. So the more we doubt God, the more we lower our shield of faith, the more that Satan is able to conquer us. See, patience is a fruit that is made evidence in our lives the more we stand on God's word. Amen. 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 The more we stand on God's word, patience is able to have her perfect work. Patience is able to flourish. Patience is able to have its way. And God's blessings can reign in your life. Because I allowed myself to be patient through the storm. Amen. So let's review. God's word goes forth. When it falls on good grounds, it's able to be planted into our hearts. When trial comes, I hold on to my faith. I believe what God says. And the more I, through faith, believe God's word, the more enduring patience is produced in my life, which makes me perfect and complete like nothing. Amen. 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 So that's a recap to the Prize of Patience, part one. Let's get started with part two. Praise the <laughs> Lord. That brings us to the other side of patience, long suffering. The Greek word for long suffering is makrofumeo. umeo. And it means to be patient in bearing the offenses, offenses and injuries of others. It means to be mild and slow in avenging. It means to be slow to anger and slow to punish people. Long suffering means to be patient when you're putting out with people and they mess. Long suffering means to be patient while people are wounding you. Long suffering means to not get even with them. To be slow to anger and slow to punish them. Slow to talk back down about them. They may have talked about you, but you won't put your list right back on. Long suffering means to stay right there in the midst of their foolishness. See, God has been suffering with his creation since the beginning of dawn, since Adam and Eve, but it bit that fruit, whatever fruit it was, in the garden. Second Peter 3 and um, 9 says that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but he is long suffering towards us. Not willing that anybody should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Ezekiel 33 and 11 says, Say to them, as long as I live, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked would turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. So why should you die, O house of Israel? The conclusion that these scriptures give us is that God is, does not delight in anybody going to hell. Amen. Hell was not designed for us, it was designed for Satan and his right. angels. Right. God is concerned about humanity. God is concerned and loves creation so much that he gave the most precious, valuable gift that he could ever give. His son. He allowed his son to be sacrificed for a wicked evil and ungrateful creation so that they may be transformed and gain access to an everlasting life. So I get why God suffers long. Why should we suffer long? That's another excellent question, class. I'm so glad you asked it. Aside from God telling us to do it, because he's the one who has the authority, we suffer long with others who miss the mark because God has suffered. And it's suffering still with us when we miss the mark. Amen. 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 Yes, ma'am. We suffer along with other people. Yes, ma'am. It's time. We put up with the offenses that come our way. Come on. We don't tap out of their lives. God bless you, man. When they miss the mark. Come on, now. Because God has suffered with us when we miss our marks. Before and after salvation. When God tells you not to gossip and you still gossip. When God tells us not to lie and we still lie. When God says don't be bitter, get rid of the bitterness and we hold on to the bitterness. We are still suffering long with us until we get it. 
because he desired to see us in heaven. See, Elder Bray has given us so many dynamic lessons in this place, and not too long ago, he preached his heart out on the power of forgiveness and the reason why we should give. One of those lessons came from Matthew chapter 18, verses 26 to 29. There was a servant who owed an enormous, exorbitant amount of money. The equivalent today would be millions and millions and millions of dollars. This debt would not only affect him, but also his whole family. He was in a hole that he could not get himself out of. And so when he was brought before his master to give an account for his debt, he said he fell to the ground, prostrated himself, saying, have patience with me, and I'm going to pay you back everything. The master of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him of that debt. See, so the servant realized that the debt he has is over and beyond what he could pay. So he begs his master to have patience with me. Suffer long with me. Come on now. Suffer long with me, please. I'll pay you back. Just put this, just, just, just give me some more grace on this. Yeah, yeah. But God in his infinite mercy does not consume him. He forgives them. So we were born into this world owing a debt that we can never repay. But God decided not to just burn us up. He decided to suffer along with us so that we may be saved. See, once upon a time, I had this um, towel. I bought, just married. You know, when you get married, you start buying things for your house. You know, make it look pretty, praise the Lord. And so I bought these nice towels. They were nice. They were comfortable. They were soft. And we stayed in this apartment, and um, we were on the bottom floor. And if anybody lives on the bottom floor, sometimes you pay, pay for the transgressions of those above us. <laughs> so some wonderful person decided to flood the toilet intentionally to get back at their roommates. And our apartment was flooded with that stinky sewage. My husband in Mercy Road just went and started grabbing towels, and he grabbed my pretty, <laughs> soft, comfortable, fuzzy towel <laughs> and threw it on that stinky, polluted water so that he may get it up. I want to let you know, brothers and sisters, that towel has never been the same. No matter how many times we washed it, it has not returned to a soft, comfortable, fuzzy and times himself. In fact, even after you just just do bathe and you and you dry yourself off one time, it goes, you have to wash it again. It does not hold the same quality and value after it encountered this polluted situation. So for me, Sister Mia, I just want to throw away the towel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to put up with this towel. Come on, man. This towel is not performing in the way it's supposed to perform. This towel is not giving me pleasure the way I need it to give me pleasure. This towel is now disgusting and irreprehensible to me. I want to get rid of the towel. So the thing is, these may have come into your lives that have polluted you a little bit, dirty you up. Change your mindset. Made you look lower than what you used to be. You are not the same after these encounters. But God is not like Sister Me. He does not say, come on, goodbye to that time. To you. In fact, he suffers long with you. He suffers long with me. He gives us another chance. And he puts us into the blood, the white machine of the blood of Christ. And when we come at that, we are better than you. In fact, we're better than what we were once first was. Yes, yes, we are redeemed. Because when it was first bought from the store, it cannot get me to heaven. When you first came into this world, no matter how good you were, you couldn't get to heaven by yourself. But once Christ redeemed you, washed you, and changed some things in your life, now you have access to the kingdom. So, this servant said, suffer along with me. And the father said, I'll suffer yes. along with you. Yes. I'll forgive your debt. Yes. Unfortunately, the story doesn't end there because that servant immediately went out and found another fellow servant who owed him a smaller debt. <laughs> that fellow slave repeats the same plea. Please suffer along with me. I'll give you back what you are owed. Just please suffer along with me. But the servant, now redeemed, became entitled. Right. 
and who would not suffer long with a fellow servant. See, he came to the realization of what his sin has cost him, and he begged for forgiveness, but he could not grasp how to forgive someone who owed a smaller debt than he originally owed. And just as God has suffered long with his creation, his place, his children, and his ambassadors on this earth in position to do the same, replicate his long suffering. We are to be patient in bearing the offenses and injuries of others. The truth of the matter is that our long suffering will always pale in comparison to what somebody else owes you. Even as believers, when we miss the mark, he's still right there waiting for us, teaching us, ministering to us, convicting us to get us right. Even if we ignore the conviction of the Holy Spirit, he's still right there, patient with us, prompting us to get it right. You know who else had a problem like this? The Corinthian church. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul paints the picture of the true definition of love. The members of this church could speak in tongues. They could prophesy. They had the faith to move God and move mountains. They were giving everything they had to the poor. They were even offering up their bodies to be burnt. Testimony meetings were on and popping at this church. It was one testimony after another of all the great things that they had done. But Paul said, everything y'all are doing don't mean anything. Your testimony meetings that y'all having for three and four hours about how much stuff y'all doing is all in bed. Y'all should have been asleep. Because every spiritual height that they were gaining meant absolutely nothing. They were claiming symbols. They're making a bunch of noise in God's ears because they had no love in their hearts. How do we know they don't have any love in their hearts? Another excellent question. Well, Paul goes on to explain to them and to instruct them that the first indication that there is love in your heart, God's love in your heart, is that you will suffer long with people. Amen. The first thing that Paul says about love is that it's patient. He has to go on to say it's kind and it does not bold, it does not brag itself up, it does not keep a list of longs. He gives all these other wonderful definitions, but the first thing he instructs the church is that you have to be patient with people. You have to suffer long with people. You cannot get back against people. They have the faith to move mountains, they have the faith of miracles, signs, and wonders, but they did not have the faith to bear the offenses of others. I'll say it again. Yeah. They had the faith to move mountains. They had the faith of miracles, signs, and wonders. You no, know, this week, this week, will be, will be. You know, you know I, every time I'm a keyboard, I can't get my keys, praise the Lord. But they had the, the faith for these miracle signs and wonders. But they didn't have the faith just to bear the offenses of other people who got on their nerves. Wow. God said that your faith was meaningless. Their faith was meaningless. See, Elder Ward pointed out something small but significant in one of our kingdom movement Bible settings when we were setting the resume of love. Hebrews 11 and 6 says that without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he proves to be the one who rewards those who seek him. So if our faith pleases God, how much more does our love Especially when it's long suffering. If, I, if we need faith to please God, if we need faith to please God, how much more do we need love for one another on this earth in order to please God? No matter what they look like, no matter the backgrounds, no matter the situation or circumstances, how much more does our love please this God? The love shown here, because remember that in English, we have one word that means a whole bunch of stuff. And the kids today, two kids tell each other they love each other. Just the other day, I'm like, oh, baby, praise the Lord. <laughs> but the love that's shown here in, in Hebrew is the same love in 1 John 4 and 18, one of my favorite scriptures. The Bible says that there is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear. Because fear involves punishment. In the New King James and King James, it said that fear involves torment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. So since 
This love, the first definition of this love is long-suffering. I want to insert that word in front of every time I see the word love. There is no fear in a long-suffering love. There's no fear in a long... When you are suffering long with someone, you don't have to be afraid about what they're going to do against you. You don't have to worry about them getting away with their offenses. You don't have to worry about you being trampled over and you losing your dignity because you suffer long with somebody. The Bible says there's no fear in a long-suffering love. Because perfect long-suffering love drives out fear. Because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in his long-suffering love. God perfects us in his long-suffering love. We are completed through this long-suffering love. We're made better because of this long-suffering love. We are delivered in this long-suffering love. So I don't have to dwell in fear when I'm residing in a long-suffering love. A few verses earlier in verse 16, John says, We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who remains in love remains in God, and God remains in him. We suffer long with people because God is long-suffering, as I stated earlier. But we re- when we remain in God and God remain in us, we are remaining in his long-suffering love. Yes, I repeat myself. We remain in God and God is able to remain in us when we remain in the long-suffering love. Mm. Pastor Singleton, uh, before he left for our Bible study, he says, you know, we exalt the offenses of other people over the righteousness of God. Right, right. Right. And that stuck with me because I had a couple trials that came knocking at my door after that and I said I won't allow their offenses to get in the way of what God told me to do because when I honor my revenge and trying to get back against someone who gets who does something to me I'm saying that Lord their offense is higher than you so therefore I follow this path of vengeance I'll follow this path of getting even. I'll follow this path of um, turning a cold shoulder to them instead of honoring you at your word and praying for them to do good to those who despitefully use me. So what I'm trying to help us understand today, the reason we should be patient when we are putting up with those who offend us, why we should be slow to anger when someone cuts us, why we should be slow to punish those who cause us pain. We should do this because God first loves us. And if God has told us to do it, he's going to reward us. And he's going to give us the strength to do it. Right. I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. Because, you know, as a teacher, I have to think about misconceptions in a lesson. I'm not punishing anyone. I'm just loving them from a distance. Mm. Therefore, this very really isn't applicable to me, Sister Mia. I'm not angry with anybody. I let go of the anger. I'm not bitter against them anymore. I just don't want to deal with them. Cool. My question for you is this. As a child of God, does your look, love look like God's love? Mm. Are you replicating the nature of God's long suffering toward those who irk you and get on your last nerve? Good question. Good. Right. As a child of God, does your love look like God's love? Mm. And are you showing love su- long suffering to those who get on your nerves? I'm going to leave you with this one last scripture, one of my other favorite scriptures that the Lord blessed me to come across. In 2 Timothy 2, 24 to 26, I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation. It says, a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone. Every single person he must be kind to, which goes along with love is patient, love is kind. Be able to teach and be patient with difficult people. Gently instructing those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change their hearts and they will learn the truth. Then they will come to their senses and escape from the devil's trap. For they have been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. One of the reasons we suffer along with people is because they don't realize that they are trapped by Satan. Amen. They don't realize that they are walking in chains. Right. They don't realize that they're employees of utter darkness. They don't realize the bondage is over their head. Right. That's why Paul tells us in Ephesians, once again, we are not wrestling against flesh and blood. Right. Okay. They're insults. You're not wrestling against them. Yeah. But against principalities. 
I wonder if you caught what John, 1 John 4 and 18 said to us, that when we fear, we're not perfected in this long-suffering love. So a long-suffering love perfects us so we don't have to fear. Now, once again in James, it says, Now let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and, pe um, perfect and complete like nothing. So what Mr. Sister Mia is trying to hearken upon in this morning is that our patience, whether enduring a trial, whether suffering long with someone, perfects us and then the world around us. So being a middle school teacher, it's, I've, it's taught me that sometimes my students just won't get it. Whether it's the lessons about plot and main idea, or whether it's the life lessons, I have to repeat myself. In fact, a lot of kids at Walla Junior High know my phrases. Walk that walk. Uh-uh. Oh, she's laughing because you already know. I've been the same. I'm still the same after you love, baby. Sometimes they don't understand these life lessons that I'm trying to impart to them, but I still repeat myself. Sometimes they miss the mark with me. Some kids have even cussed me out. But I still correct them, still smile, and say hello to them the next day. Because one day God will bless them to get it. I may not see the evidence of that fruit. But one day somebody's going to get it. In fact, God gives me little pups. Because I, I, all I have to do is say, uh uh. And the kid I intend to stop, five other ones stopped in addition to him, who I didn't even see. In fact, other people will um, tell, they will get on other kids, you need to be walking that walk. So I hear the instruction that God bless me to give them, repeating it, everyone without me having to say something. So one of the lessons I'm trying to currently impart into a particular group of students is that when they chase and run around, they're not supposed to do that. Not realizing they can hurt them so they can run into somebody. One time I was pregnant, someone almost ran into me, and I was like, no, you need to stop. So when I finally catch my breath and catch up to them, they immediately become defensive with me and tell me that so-and-so tagged them, so-and-so hit them, and they have to get their lick back. Then I ask them, in order to not receive any consequences, who do you have to prove yourself to? Me or them? Because you don't want a consequence for me, but you're trying to prove something to them. Who are we trying to please on this morning? The world may mock our faith, but they crave the love of God. Remember that it's through endurance that the fruit of God is made evident in our life. His love, his joy, his peace. You know, people are pursuing happiness, peace of mind, and all these things God provides. So they crave what is ours. So when we suffer long, God bless us and the others to deliverance. Amen. Amen.